Yo, Elliot, my question for you is, what tests and questions should I take into account when courting a woman? I know that you can never be 100% sure, but at least I want to test and have good discernment. Thank you for all that you're doing. So your question reminds me of a new book that I'm reading by a guy named Timothy Gordon. Uh, and, the, and the name of the book is A Case for Patriarchy. And he asserts that we're experiencing the downfall of our society, the breakup of our culture, the destruction of the family because of an attack on fatherhood. And if you really ex explore that word patriarchy, it literally means father rule. And in the book, The Case for the Patriarchy, he describes what a patriarchal society is like and why it flourishes as a result of having rightly ordered families. And, you know, the book is written uh, from a Christian Catholic perspective, but you got to understand that patriarchy, uh, as it was used as a tool to, as a, as a way of life, let me put it, for people in the West is what allowed us to experience the type of order and the type of uh, prosperity that we experienced over the past you know, several hundred years, you know, maybe 2000 years or more. Um, it's only been the recent attack on patriarchy, basically fatherhood, that has caused us to fall so far from the Lord as a culture, right? And so your question to me is, what test or question should I take into account when courting a woman? Well, then you need, if you want to know the right way to court a woman, you got to look at uh, what kind of life you want to live with her. And I have, am of the... Uh, a belief, I'm of the conviction, as is the author of the case of patriarchy, that in order for society to rebound or to heal from our fallen, from, from our falling away, uh, we got to go back to patriarchy, which means father led homes, husband led homes, right, where men take their rightful place as leaders, uh, of course, within the the microcosm of society, right? The cellular association with society, the building blocks of society, which is the home, but then it extends outward. And all of our authority and responsibility is divinely ordained, right? And so the first thing I would want to know about a woman is what is her faith like? What is her religion? What does she believe about God the Father and his order for humankind on this planet, particularly as it relates to the most fundamental building block, and that is the family. And so there is, uh, in, in this book, he, he references the Bible, he references, he references uh, Paul's assertions and admonitions to the Ephesians about how to go about living a godly life um, through the family and in the family. And he, of course, he begins with the, with the woman and the husband, the man and his wife. And one of the things that our egalitarian post, postmodern, post-enlightenment uh, culture has basically disregarded and has been cause for the breakdown of the patriarchy and breakdown of the family is uh, this idea proposed by the Bible that a woman is to submit to her husband's authority in the home, right? And so we're going to talk a little bit about how to make that happen, but that's one of the tests or questions that I would ask a woman that I'm courting. And I love that word courting. I think it's a word that needs to make a big comeback. It's something that we need to begin practicing again in our culture, but it's really the vetting process for making a woman your wife. And if I was going to do that today, or if I would give advice to someone who's thinking about doing that today, I would want to get very clear about what my expectation for a wife would be based on the divine prescription given by God in the Bible. And I would ask a pretty triggering question, right? A pretty triggering question that would give you an indication as to, you know, whether or not she's totally on board with where you're going and would make a good helpmate for you and your family, or if she's perhaps open to it and willing to be molded in the, in the likeness of this order. 
or she totally rejects it and resists and wants to fight you. And that question is, what do you think about a wife's submission to her husband? Right. That is going that is going to be a litmus test that is going to draw a, a great divide between those women that are going to make good wives in the long run and those who are going to give you a hard time. Because feminism has taught women that it, it, not only are they equal to men, but they're better than men. If you look at like, you know, the popular TV shows or you look at, you know, commercials on TV, it's always the woman that's the hero. In fact, if you just look at uh, the movies now, right, like Star Wars and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, the superhero is now generally the woman. The woman is the leader, the woman is the hero, the woman is in charge, the woman beats up all the men, and the men are usually dumb, they're usually weak, they're usually, uh, they're usually not fit for leadership. And this is, this, is the, this is the depiction that we're given that we ultimately then take into our lives and start living by. And so you see where these disordered homes don't thrive because of the, because of the topsy turvy, because of the backwards, um, upside down, if you will, order. A woman, a woman doesn't want to be in charge and a man is not made to be led. It's really supposed to be the other way around. And men and women would be much happier, both men and women would be much happier if the order was established. Uh, a woman is granted the graces to stay at home and to rear children, bear children, to be a homemaker, to serve her husband and be receptive to his righteous leadership, his loving demands, his loving um, instruction. But if as is popular in culture, the man is the one that's taking the Taking the, taking the shots from the woman, the, the man who's following the woman, two things happen. There's a depolarization in the relationship and the woman on one hand will grow resentful. She'll grow hard and she'll grow resentful towards her husband because she's being forced to work outside the home. And, she's be, and as a result is being forced to take on a masculine role in the relationship. And that depolarizes the relationship by, ter by turning her off. Right, a woman who has to take on that masculine role of leadership in her home because her husband is either blue pill washed and doesn't understand that it's his role to lead. Both of them may not notice that, or he's just a weakling. He's a weakling and he doesn't know how to lead. Uh, either he's ignorant of it or he just doesn't have the, the, the chutzpah, right? He doesn't have the guts uh, to do it. And subconsciously somewhere on the inside, there's a visceral experience by that woman where she shuts off to that man. And the same thing in a different way happens to a man who's in a relationship where he's emasculated, right? And that's essentially what it is to be emasculated is to have your, have your man card stripped from you if, for lack of better terms. And as a result, he will grow resentful as well. He'll grow resentful towards her and he'll hate himself because he can't establish the order that he knows is right, that is divinely inspired and is what got the West where we, you know, where we were when we were most prosperous, right? Christendom. And so when you say, what test or question should I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even go so far as to quote unquote test, right? Because they may be a little bit harder. I think tests come with time and you'll be tested, she'll be tested. And that's really when you get to see what someone's made of, right? So that is something that's going to be, uh, that's something that's going to unfold over time. But questions just to see where she's at, I would, I would propose an outline of what it is that I believe is a rightly ordered family. I would want to know if and how many children she wants to have. I want to know if she's willing to submit to my lead and she's willing to stay home with her children and to be a wife. I want a, I want a wife, I want a woman that wants to be a wife, right? They say that women want weddings, right? Women want weddings. Women want to get married, but women don't want to be wives, right? I've heard some of the red pill guys on YouTube say stuff like that. Women want, they want a wedding. They want to get married, right? Because there's status associated with, but they don't want to be a wife. And to be a wife means to be a helpmate, right? To be the second in charge, right? How would you say like captain and then his lieutenant, right? Is to be a lieutenant. My wife holds tremendous power in my home, 
but, but as a lieutenant, right? As, as the vice president, if you will. And that's an uncomfortable conversation to have in our egalitarian world. And one that I would definitely pose to a woman before I married her, because as you've seen with many of the men in this program who are married, they didn't know this. They didn't vet this way. Uh, they may have just not even been privy to this biblical order, this divine order that was established by God in the garden and is expected of us so that we can thrive, right? It's, it's biological, right? Bi just, just biology dictates that the stronger will lead, right? And, not, and leading isn't just about authority, right? Because a lot, the, the feminists have taught women that all leadership is tyranny. Well, that's not true at all. Divine, benevolent, loving leadership is about, as St. Paul says, treating your wife like she's a part of your body. When in, in the Bible, when it says that, you know, uh, well, Eve came from Adam's body, and then he goes on to say, remember that you're one flesh. And when you're sleeping with a woman, you become one flesh. In the Bible, it's just interesting, just a, 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 an aside that I noticed today. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, and I'm reading through Abraham right now, so I'm only up to read chapter 25. There are no wedding ceremonies, but yet people are married. And so I, I, my opinion is, and of course, you know, maybe there are scholars that know better than me, but when you sleep with a woman, when you know a woman, as, I, as he describes in the Bible, when you come to know a woman, that's your wife. So I see a lot of you guys calling your, your, your wives, legitimate wives, girlfriends or fiancés. In my opinion, that when you're sleeping with a woman, especially in our promiscuous age where you're, you know, people are sleeping with multiple, multiple different partners, but if you have a steady woman and you're having sex with her, that in essence is your wife. And so at that point, these conversations need to be had, right? Because you're, as we spoke about earlier before, all those bonding hormones are being, uh, being flooded, the body's flooded with these bonding hormones, both the men and the women, they become sort of emotionally attached with one another, right? Maybe more so than the other with one. But the bottom line is there is a unification of flesh. You do become one flesh. The cascade of hormones that are synchronized or that, that, are, that are present during a synchronized orgasm uh, between a man and a woman is unifies. It unifies us. A lot of times it may be one more than the other, right? So if a woman, especially if you're laying it down, right? And she has multiple orgasms. You just got to imagine that with each orgasm she has for you, she's going to she's going to become more and more wanting to be your wife, wanting to be more and more one flesh. She's essentially taking on your spirit in your body, right? And uh, and the same in, in a different way, perhaps, but very similar as we described earlier with men. And so, if if a man is the head of his wife, and the woman is the body, the heart. The head needs to do, and the head is compelled to do everything in his power to preserve and to care for and to provide and to protect the body. And so the body, the body is of no less noble position than the head. But of course, in our world, we've been taught head, 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 head. Woman needs to be a head too, uh, that there's no place for a redeeming paradigm position for the body, the woman, right? That, that, is, that is led by the head. So, you know, without going too, too much deeper into it, right? Just giving you the, you know, the questions I would ask, it would be that. I would want to know, you know, what does she think about biblical patriarchy? What does she think about the divinity of the family? And what is her, what are her views on order in the home? Thus, the wife submitting to her husband, the husband is the head of his wife. These are these are just archaic old ideas that uh, that need to be done away with as progressive have us believe. In fact, according to the author of uh, the case for patriarchy, he says that it's the most progressive thing to do is to go the most progressive thing to do in a world that's sliding backsliding towards hell is to go back to tradition. Right. So really, in a way, you are the progressive. I, I know I'm a progressive and I know I'm a progressive because I'm talking things that most people will not talk about. I'm thinking in ways and proposing ideas that most people will not even concern, consider. You go to 99.9% .9 of churches and they will not have touched these, this topic. That's how gynocentric our society has become, how much feminism has colored every single thing that we've done. It's a beautiful thing for a woman to play her role as the 
submissive partner in the relationship. You know how you know that that's the truth? Because a woman wants sex. If a woman wants sex, you know what she wants? She wants leadership, right? The man is the leader in the sexual act. She's the submitter in the sexual act. And as a result of playing that passive role, right? When I say passive, today women will approach, right? And it's a little weird, but because, you know, they've been overly masculinized and they've been taught that that's appropriate for them, but it's not, and it doesn't serve them or anybody else. It goes against reason. But if she's wanting to be approached and she's and she opens herself up, she's essentially saying, I operate out of a passive, yielding, opening energy. That's the beauty of being a woman. And that's why they need to be more protected and they should be more conservative than even men, because their place is to protect, you know, protect your value. But then when the right opportunity happens, the, the right key comes along, right? Then she opens up, right? The right key. They say that, uh, you know, a, a woman and a man is like a lock and a key, right? And if it's a, if, if one key can open up, the man is a key. If the key can open up a lot of locks, it's a master key, right? I don't know if I agree with this totally, but you can see. But a, but a lock that's opened by a lot of different keys is a shitty lock, right? And so this just, this just is evidence of the nature of the relationship between men and women, right? The woman is the receiver. She's the opener. And as a result, she is the one that goes second. Man goes first, woman goes second, right? Man approaches, woman yields. Man leads shows the way, leads the way, the woman submits and follows. It's really not brain science, right? It's not, it, it's not brain surgery. Uh, it doesn't require uh, you to be a biblical scholar or to be a saint to understand the biological realities of this. The problem is that we've completely ignored science, right? This is scientific, if you, if you will. It's even scientific, right? The things I'm saying aren't untrue. They're true. A man is stronger. A man is more aggressive. A man is built for leadership. It's so where we're taller, we're bigger, right? We're more aggressive, we're more assertive, we're more courageous, right? We're more detached, meaning that we can make decisions rationally rather than emotionally. That's the head. The head makes decisions rationally, the body makes decisions emotionally. But if the emotion, as is you know, dominant in our culture today, if emotion carries the day, then you get pure chaos. And so this is why families aren't working because they're being led by the body rather than the head. And that leads to pure chaos. So all things that I just want you guys to understand, plus a shout out to Timothy Matthews. I think that's his name. Uh, Gordon, Timothy Gordon, author of Case for Patriarchy, just a book that I've been reading recently that kind of inspired my answer to this question. But you guys know where I stand on this. I stand on making families great again. Uh, I'll put this one last piece out as it relates to uh, premarital chastity. This whole order of the home, or order of the relationship, this divine order of you know God in Christ, Christ over man, man over woman, is totally subverted when you fornicate. Why is that the case? Why is a lack of chastity lead to a weakening of the 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 head and body relationship between? Because if a man is swayed by his lower nature, he's controlled by his need for suckling and sucking and sex and sensation and yummy, good, goody, gooey feelings that are associated with sex, rather than being firm, rather than being chaste, rather than being stoic, rather than being strong, then, then the woman subverts his power outside of the marriage relationship, outside of the one flesh relationship, outside of the, the eternal bond of man and wife. If she usurps that power before the relationship goes into its eternal bond, then there, it's going to be very difficult to reverse the roles. One of the things that ends up happening, and I see it with a lot of guys in this uh, in this program, is that you, you 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 have sex with a woman thinking that there's some sort of conquest there. Wow, I got it. But very quickly, the tables turn and she's like, nah, I got you. Right. And so this is how women in a promiscuous age uh, dominate over men. It's it's our fault. We've simped. We've totally simped as men. We've given our power away 
Why? Because of our lust. And our lust leads to the breaking of, of the virtue of charity. And when you break the virtue of charity, you lose all leadership. And I'm sorry, charity, chastity. You lose all leadership. You lose leadership. You lose yourself. And so you're losing yourself to these women because of you know, the warm spot between their legs. Rather than being rational, rather than being logical, rather than using discernment and, uh, and being chaste. So that's another thing that I would, I would, that's one test I would put out there, right? And look, I'm not in you guys' shoes. A lot, of, a lot of the things I'm talking about in a way is theoretical to me because I haven't been dating, but from my studies, my experience as a coach, the questions that I receive from you guys, I can't condone fornication as, and I can't say that it's a good idea for us. There, there's nothing in it that points to the fact that it could be a good idea. Feminism usurped the patriarchy through the sexual revolution. You got to understand that. The 1960s and 1970s with the sexual revolution and sexual promiscuity and licentiousness was a plot by feminists in order to usurp man's power. Now we've lost all of our power. We either give it away to women or we give it away to porn. That's another thing that was uh, a fruit of the sexual revolution is this idea that like, hey, it's okay to watch porn and to get addicted to jerking off. Well, you see where that's led us. It's led us to the weakening of our wills, the weakening of our, our power, our strength, and our leadership as men. We're, we're weak because we're blowing our loads all over the place, getting addicted to, to screen sex, jerking off, and promiscuity. So another test I would, I would put out there if I was looking to get married, which is really the only purpose of being together and getting together and, and bonding in unity and becoming one flesh with someone, right? It's the only reason, right? Promiscuity is entertainment. It's purely entertainment, right? That's the difference between eating ice cream and cookies and candy and goodies because they taste good, but they rot your body and being disciplined about eating, you know, good, healthy meat, healthy vegetables, fruits, things of this nature. The man who, who embarks upon the journey of chastity so that he can have a healthy relationship is like the man that's eating healthy food even though it's not as sweet and, uh, and dopamine addictive as, say, muffins and cupcakes, right? Which is, you know, sissies eat that stuff. Men shouldn't be eating that stuff. So I would see where she is and where you are with regard to sex and fornication. Now, if you guys are already boning, look, you know, uh, it's a slippery slope. I'd be mindful. I would just try to keep my eyes open and try to be aware, try to be self-aware of the cascade that could inevitably unfold by giving your power away that way to a woman. Um, and then also what she thinks about marriage, family, and the divine order in the home. So that's my opinion on that, bro. I hope some of that helps you and uh and you make the right choice done yo it's your bro elliot i hope you enjoyed that video if you did you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent king transformation classes with my students where among other things we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things as it relates to becoming kings in our lives and fitness business and with women if that sounds like you and you want to join a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day in every way in this degenerate age then it's real simple just follow me on Instagram and then DM me the word King, K-I-N-G, and then me and my team will get back to the details to see if you qualify. I really hope to see you at the next meeting. Done.